blowing the horn. They're waving, you know. <laughs> I got we got. And I said, well, see, you listen. See? So. Well, this morning, we're living a Christian life. Well, it's not what it says. It's Christ-like life. And um, it's, uh, it's surprising. Um, I don't know what's surprising, but whenever we think about living a Christian life, um, uh, if we think of it, maybe we don't think about it, in, in what it is in an everyday lifestyle. And I'm going to, it's funny, not funny, but how that my, um, the sermon I have is about um, reframe, and I'll describe all that later. But one of the things is that uh, how do we look, re, how do we re-examine what we already see? Okay, what's in the picture? Okay, how do we re-examine, reframe that? Well, one of the things I, <laughs> as I was reading over this and found all this material on it, um, that we make about 150 decisions a day, minor decisions. And the idea is, what effect does Christianity, what effect does the biblical principles have upon those everyday 150 decisions? And um, there are, in a life, in a, in a course of a year, there is maybe one, two, three major decisions, life-changing decisions we'll make in a year. All the rest of it's going to be those everyday decisions, 150 decisions a day that we're going to make. So how does our faith and how does our understanding of Scripture and our understanding of the, of the Bible, how does it play into making those decisions? Does it influence us? What influences us the most? Our logic and our human humanness, humankind, you know, like um, situational ethics. It's not a big topic anymore, but I remember one, uh, one individual was taking, had, was, you know, they were doing courses at UPJ, and it was on, I don't know, it wasn't like a college course. It was some, I don't know, about life course, whatever. And, um, and they were basically te- te- teaching situational ethics. And the question was, if you are at work and something happens and you can lie to get out of, the, to get out of it and there's going to be no repercussions or you can tell the truth and there'll be repercussions, which one of these is correct? The answer is, A, lie. Because nobody's going to know. <laughs> and see, and that's the whole point, that situational ethics is based upon what you deem um, necessary to make a decision about life that you think within the scope of your life and the framework of what you see is going to make uh, a difference in your life so that's going to, take you further along. Uh, There was another thing uh, I was reading, and it says, why are there so many incompetent men in leadership positions? (laughs) And it wasn't written by a lady. (laughs) I thought for sure it was written by a lady. But uh, the idea is that people love to be, people love people who are in love with themselves. (laughs) And People who can perform and can seemingly have the abilities to do the charismatic uh, personality, people will fall for that rather than falling for the, the ethics of everyday decisions. And, the, and that was kind of the answer to um, why so many incompetent men are in positions. And the concluding was that women should practice being more competent in everyday decisions. (laughs) So we'll go on from there. So the objective of the lesson for us is to recognize the importance of living a Christ-like life and following Christ continuously. So it's a matter of a lifestyle. It's, you know, choosing between lying or stealing or bearing false witness or whatever isn't really a dischoice. It's a a no-brainer. Did I tell you my no-brainer? Did I tell you this one? And I feel bad. Um, one of our friends was having, you know, surgery for an aneurysm. And, uh, of course, 
I prayed with them and, you know, went through all that. And, you know, I was going through the explanation that you, you know, you don't have a choice. You know, doctors say, the x-rays say, the MRI says, you can't, you, can't, you have to have the surgery. It's a done deal. So I'm telling her this, and then I said, well, you know, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> and she says, I was hoping you wouldn't bring up a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't bring up a brain joke. You know, so <laughs> the idea is in our life, there are some decisions we don't, have to, we, we, we don't have a choice over. The choice is already made for us. We are the ones who are putting ourselves in a should I, shouldn't I, back and forth, you know, decision. And in reality, um, you know, we used to, the, the old thing, what would Jesus do? Well, well the idea is what is Jesus doing? <laughs> in our life. And so um, our, in the Old Testament, our call to lead a godly life begins in the Old Testament. God provides laws and regulations which impact the Israelites' spiritual, physical, and moral well-being. So we have the Old Testament laws that affected all of this. But in the New Testament, um, they are crouched in God's directives for the people to follow a pattern of holiness. So there's a pattern that is established. In the Old Testament, it was laws, do this and do that. But in, in, um, in the New Testament, we have the revelation of the Spirit, the revelation of God's Word to speak to us uh, and already have those things in place. So um, living a Christian life and making right decisions, all those 150 correct decisions, you make them all correct, doesn't mean everything's going to go our way and everything's going to turn out all right. Would be nice if it did, but it doesn't. Jesus did everything right, and they crucified him because it was people interpreting him. We have God interpreting us, and so we then are to do the right thing no matter what other people say or do, um, and no matter how that they may object to what's, what's going on. So, um, So anyone who assumes being a Christian will always be an easy task does not have a view that Christ experienced while here. Uh, we will be tempted, tested, but Christ will enable us to follow him. Through his indwelling presence, we can resist the devil and overcome those difficulties and overcome and live an overcoming life. So what happens in the lesson, we go from jump through a number of different scriptures and a number of different uh, writers, but all by the same inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that um, we are called, first section is called to live a holy living. Call to holy living. First Peter 1, verses, uh, verse 15, 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. So it's kind of easy in one sense to speak of, uh, of God's holiness um, than to focus on our need to follow that particular pattern of holy living. Um, some of the reasons that we use um, to kind of give the excuse that we don't have to is we're human. Uh, no one is perfect. A little bending of the rules won't hurt. <laughs> I'm not that bad. I always, I always like that one. Uh, but deep inside, there are other possibilities such as the, the reasons for us saying human, not perfect, and so on, it is not taking seriously the divine directive given in the Word of God, that somehow we look at, somehow people will look at the Scriptures as divine suggestions. <laughs> I don't, it's like, God doesn't really expect us to do this, does he? He doesn't really have a plan that involves not stealing. <laughs> you know, how am I going to get by? So, uh, not taking uh, the divine directives. Lacking faith in Christ's sanctifying power. That is, lacking faith that God is able to separate us from that which is not holy, that which is evil, and draw us closer to God. And the third is not wanting to put forth the necessary effort. You mean it's an effort? <laughs> it takes an effort. You mean it's not just going to come easy? Right. 
So the calling to be holy begins with properly preparing our mind. That's in verse 13. He says, girding up the loins of your mind. Now, <clears throat> for us, you know, girding up the loins of our mind, it, that just doesn't seem to have a, <laughs> you know, I don't have a girdle. <laughs> Do you have a girdle? <laughs> You know, girding up is that the people wore these long robes and that was their common things. And so when they had to work or they were going to really be running or, you know, whatever, half running, whatever, they would pull up their robe and wrap it around them. And so they would gird up their loin, they would gird up their robes so that they were able to work. And so the idea is, that we are to gird up our mind or properly preparing our mind for the task that is before us. Peter calls in verse 14, he, he says that Christians should live as obedient children, not being conformed to the passions of unbelievers, which we, weren't, which we were once, once were. So the idea is that we have been changed and because of the change, the Holy Spirit then is making the difference for our lives and... Um, Verse 15, it kind of skips over this. The directive to be holy in all manner of conversation refers to all actions, not just our speech. So it's, it's, it's the word of God, the word of God permeating our mind, girding our thoughts, guarding our thoughts. One, one translation has it as garrison, gar- putting a garrison, you know, surrounding our mind with, as it were, with armed soldiers, <laughs> So we garrison our minds and our hearts. Um, Following a pattern uh, that is both spiritual and physical. Um, Then we move to Romans. Paul says to the church at Rome, and uh, that, that was Peter's declaration, and this is Paul's declaration. He says that um, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and in, iniquity and, uh, unto iniquity. The idea is he calls that um, infirmity of your flesh is that it's a disease, as it were, a graphic example of the difference between life with and life without Christ. So the infirmity of your flesh, the sickness of your flesh will destroy you. And, and he says that, you know, as you, as you have yielded to this sickness, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. So he has this, this declaration that as you were once in this sickness of sin, you now are to yield yourself unto the righteousness that is in Christ. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from, right, you were free from righteousness. Now, when you were servants or slaves of sin, the, the people the, of, the, of the Roman Empire, one third to one half of the empire were slaves. Okay? So when, when Paul wrote about being slaves... They knew, they knew what he was talking about. And there were some slaves that were, um, that were uh, the, the masters of their business. You know, they taught their children. They were like, you know, part of the family. And of course, there were slaves that were um, the worst. Uh, they were harsh physical labor, t- cruel taskmasters. You know, they were sold, bought and sold like pieces of property. Uh, so... The, the slavery of sin can have light, sickness of the soul, can seemingly have light or great differences in it, but it's still slaves. Then, um, for when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit hath ye then unto those things whereon you are now ashamed? So basically, what fruit is there from that which you, that in your shame, what fruit, did, what fruit was produced from that way of living? Uh, for the end of this is death. Yeah. But, verse 22, 
But now being made free from sin and become servants to God. Now, one of the ways that we, that we read this uh, determines how we interpret it. Because if we are servants of God, we are slaves of God. Okay, But slaves of God, Paul calls it a bondservant. That we are free to make a choice and that we choose to have the brand. The, the slaves would be branded with the mark of the person they were serving. Now, if you, were a, if you were a slave of, you know, taking care of the household and whatever, you were a slave, you had that mark. But a bond servant is one who willfully and intentionally takes the mark of the home of the ownership of this other person. And so whenever he is saying that we are servants of Jesus Christ, we are seeing how that this is a very, you know, the, the other type of slavery is legalism and miserably fashioned. And, and um, so that's the kind of religion of the Old Testament that talked about this, uh, you know, slaves of so and you know, exchanging one bondage for another. That's why some, some people think of Christianity that you're, you're just exchanging one form of uh, manipulative behavior for another form of manipulative behavior. Well, it's not true. The, the priority of coming to Christ is that um, he is the one who will set us free and that we are servants of him. It's a positive relationship when one chooses righteousness rather than sin. So it's a positive uh, approach that God is wanting to bring into our life. Then verse 20 and 22, um, but now being made free from sin, and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto boldness and the end everlasting life. So it's a, it's a boldness to, uh, and, uh, you know, um, with all boldness entering into the presence of God. You know, in the, in the uh, sinful characteristic, it's a, you know, boldness to go out and do, and you know, I'm a free person doing what I want to do, and sinning and you know doing this and doing that in reality they're slaves to their sin and here the greatest boldness is that we have this boldness to enter into the throne room of God and we are his and he is ours and it's a very positive relationship because God is not we're not going in there to be punished we're going in there to find out God's best and blessing for our life and the path he has for our lives thoughts any any thoughts No brainer. <laughs> so, well, one more part to this first section, and this one is in Corinthians, Corinth, Second Corinthians, and this is Paul writing again. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, and. Having, therefore, these promises. If you don't exchange, you know, um, if, you, you know, if we're going to fill our life with something, okay? People who were doing one type of lifestyle and they change, well, then they have to fill their life with another lifestyle. You just can't stop doing this and do nothing. It doesn't work. We've got to fill ourselves with the promises of God and recognize how that the Scripture and the promises of God and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit are at work in us in the very present moment. Um, Paul says, let us demonstrate, you know, saying that he lived like he is preaching to the Corinthians. He had to, you know, Paul had to give up his, his former way of doing things, of killing Christians and his former way of approaching religion and life. He, you know, he had to give that up. Um, Paul pointed out the need for them to separate themselves from the patterns and lifestyle of the surroundings. Um, in, in Corinth, they were characterized by the... Um, Poseidon, you know, the, the god Poseidon, who was the god of the sea, 
and, and Aphrodite, goddess of love, they were the main uh, dominating gods of the, of the culture in, that, in, in Rome. And so Paul is telling them, you know, we've got to give up those former ways of doing things that following the culture of, 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 um, of Rome, of Poseidon and of Aphrodite, you've got to give that up and take on the relationship that you have with Christ and live wholly separate lives from these types of sins and, you know, and, and so on. So we, we, we see how that they were to separate themselves. Um, so pursuing holiness is inwardly and outwardly. Holiness cannot be rega- re- regulated to only one dimension of our life. <laughs> and there, are, there are those that um, they dress the part <laughs> and um, you know, they, you know, from their dress they declare that they're holy and their actions. And then there are others that it doesn't matter what they do, I'm holy on the inside. <laughs> it doesn't work. I mean, up in Maine, a um, long time ago, <laughs> there was um, there was whenever t- television, you know, at first come along, and there was a group uh, of people that you know declared that TVs, the television, was the 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 tool of the devil, and they were not allowed to have it in their homes. So uh, we we find that whenever they whenever they um, looked at that they came across and said well you know uh, and, and they preached against it and all those types of things and here we have where they where they um, uh, as they preached against it then the the person who was speaking against it they found he, they had a television in their in their closet and they said well that's only to watch the news so <laughs> so the idea that holiness is to be not only in our hearts but in be in our actions outwardly and in our lives inwardly. Okay, um, our, our lesson that we are studying is the living a Christ-like life. And uh, we were seeing how that uh, it uh, begins with Christ and separation to live holy lives. And the next section is living in sanctification or separation, separating ourselves from sin. And this is the, for the scriptures that are taken here in John chapter 17, uh, verses 16, 17, and 21. Um, they are not of the world, and this is, uh, Jesus is, has been, in this chapter, Jesus has been praying for himself in verses 1 through 5, and that he, and in these, this chapter, he speaks of how that he has glorified the Father, and how that he has done so through his earth, earthly ministry, and then he also asked God to glorify him in, 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 uh, uh, before his creation, before the world. But then he goes on in verse 16, and he's praying for uh, his followers. And he says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So Jesus, you know, it's interesting that Jesus does not tell or ask that his disciples, followers be taken out of the world. He, he prays and asks for them to be... Um, they, to recognize they're not of this world. And he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So he's asking, he's pray, his prayer is that God would sanctify, separate them from the world by his word. And his word is the truth. And as the truth of the word uh, is in their minds and in their hearts and in their actions, it would, it would be contrary to what we said in Paul and Rome, that the, the, the goddess, the god uh, Poseidon and, uh, and uh, Aphrodite, the, the, that culture of sin, well, that was going on in Rome. Well, here we have Christ praying that his followers um, would not be influenced by these sins and by these cultures and even by the legalism of, of Judaism. And then he goes on in verse 21 to say that they may all be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. It, that verse is one of those, um, uh, I think of it, whenever we, it says that Christ is in us, we are in Christ. 
Jesus is in the Father, the Father is in Christ. That we are one with God. That there, you know, we're not separated from God, we are one with him. And whenever we have Christ in our heart and our life, that we are one with him. So whenever we're praying, we're not just praying to, uh, to God up there somewhere, we're praying to God who is, who is everywhere present and, and he's living within us. And so our prayers can be reflective of what is in our heart because Christ is in our heart and what is God wanting to do in and through our life? So we're one with Christ and Christ is one with us and so going about our daily living is Christ living through us. The steps of the righteous person are ordered by the Lord. So God is working through us, living through us, and, and we are wanting his spirit to abide and to guide. So asking for what's in our heart may be asking for what God wants to bring into our life. So it's important that we see the oneness that we have with the Father, and Jesus says that he has with the Father, and what he has, the oneness that he has with us, so that the world may believe that, that, that the that Father, you have, that Jesus is saying, that the world may believe that, that he is sent by the Father. And it's going to be seen through the followers of Jesus. The followers of Jesus are going to portray this, are going to live this out. And so they're going to be, as it were, sanctified, separated from sin, and that separation is a, you know, we're saved um, whenever we ask Christ to forgive us of our sins, but sanctification is a, a lifelong process of growing closer to the Lord. Uh, the next section is in Hebrews, uh, perfected through suffering, and this is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. This is the, as it were, the means of our sanctification. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So going back to that oneness, for it became him for whom all, from, from whom are all things, meaning that God, you know, God in him, in, in, everything lives and has its being in Christ. He, you know, he was there in the creation, created the world, and uh, by whom are, are all things. And <clears throat> so Christ has created all this, and, he is, and, and now he is coming to help bring us back to that which he has, uh, which we were created for, to serve him. Um, and, it's, and it talks about how that the captain of our salvation, meaning Christ, was perfected through his sufferings, his you know, death on the cross, his scourging, death on the cross. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. <laughs> it's God, it's Christ, that we're one with him and he is one with us. That he that sanctifieth Christ and we who are sanctified, set apart for Christ, we're one in this. So it isn't like we have to figure out, is God for me in this or God against me in this? No, he's always for us. Um, so we are allowing the Spirit of God to help us to separate us according to the word. What is the word that Christ speaks to us? So, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. <laughs> Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brother, his sister. He's not ashamed to speak of us in those terms. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing the, unto thee. So we're seeing how that this, this all works together in uh, how that Christ was perfected through his sufferings and how that he lives in us and, and speaks and comes through us. Amen. So, any thoughts? You're all very talkative today. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> we have Sunday school in this hour, which is um, now until about five, ten more minutes, and then we break, and then we have church. So you, you kind of know the pattern. <laughs> so welcome. <laughs> yeah, welcome. Um, 
Any, any thoughts? Anything? They're very talkative. Very talkative group. All right. All right. Well, we're, we are praying his word, meaning that there's a need in our, there's something we feel is our need, but God already knows what that is. And our prayer, our prayers are a, a, um, an act of faith to declare God's promises for our own hearing and for, you know, the belief that God is going to do a work in our life. And um, so uh, it's all right. <laughs> we're supposed to pray. And sometimes I think it's uh, verbalizing and putting together our thoughts and putting together those things that God has already given us. You know, God wants to bring these things about in our life. God wants to bring about his direction and his plan and his purpose. He wants to bring that about. So we then are hopefully being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to God speaking in our heart and saying that we are declaring the same as God is declaring and see what happens. In uh, verse uh, 22 of 1 Thessalonians, um, I'm talking about, you know, Christ-like life, appear, abstain from all appearances of evil. Hmm. Abstain from all appearances of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. So whenever we're, we're seeing how that our life is to be separated from every appearance of that which is breaking of God's commands, and that the God's peace would sanctify, would separate us completely. And I pray, this is Paul's prayer, and I pray God, your whole, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's this prayer that God is going to, we abstain from all appearances of evil, and that God is going to present us blameless in front of Christ. So faithful is he that called you, and faithful is he who is going to complete that calling. So, and the third part is um, Acts chapter one, verse eight. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. So the whole aspect of walking with Christ and understanding that God is with us and then moving to this position of, of separation and receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, that we're going to be his witness that it's going to progress uh, from separation to individual relationship to um, what Christ is going to do through us as we witness to the world. Um, and we are his witness of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. So we are, we, whenever we talk about our testimony, our testimony is what God has done for us, what God is doing in us. And so we are his witnesses of the things that he has promised to do in our life. And then verse uh, 22 in Galatians, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Going back to this relationship with God, that we are crucifying, killing, dying off, putting to death the things that are contrary to what God wants us to do, those 150 decisions, little decisions we make a day, that we are crucifying the flesh. And whenever it says this, the whole, the, the, you know, that you shall receive the, 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 the fruit of the Spirit. Often we thought about this as, um, okay, fruit trees. <laughs> fruit trees grow fruit, you know, and right now they're not growing fruit. They're kind of in hibernation, you know, 
storing up and preparing things. <clears throat> but when it says that the, the, the Holy, the fruit of the Spirit is recognizing that the Holy Spirit himself, okay? I often think of, uh, I often thought of this in the context that, okay, we have the Holy Spirit and then he's got this package of stuff he gives to us, okay? You know, love, joy, peace, patience, you know. There's this package of things he gives to us. And then there are these packages of uh, gifts, you know, um, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, you know, tongues, interpretation of tongues, healings, you know, all that. We, there's this package of gifts, okay? Well, it's not packages. It is, it is the Holy Spirit himself is love. The Holy Spirit himself, the person of the Holy Spirit, is joy. It isn't the package that we haven't received yet. That when we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit is in us and, and, and he is the one, the Holy Spirit, he is the one who is our peace. He is the one who is our word of knowledge or wisdom or, or gift. He is that. It isn't like a package that he has to, to give to us. Whenever we have Christ and we've forgiven, when Christ has forgiven us, the Holy Spirit abides within us and that it, he is this. He is, this is characteristic. That's, that's who the Holy Spirit is. He is joy. He is peace. He is patience. He is long-suffering. So when we have Christ in our heart, we have all of these things there. When it talks about separation from sin and sanctification, the Holy Spirit is these things in us. We don't have to go get them or wait for the, wait for the Holy Spirit to, you know, mail them out from heaven <laughs> and, and show up at the front door by FedEx. <laughs> you know, I think I got the Holy Spirit. I got this package from God today. <laughs> you know? No, it isn't this package. It is the person of the Holy Spirit. And he is this to us. And then the last verse is, He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So, we are a part of every prayer that we pray. Oh, and remember that. We are a part of the answer to every prayer that we pray. And of the 150 or so small decisions that we make every day, they are a result of the decision we have made. We have chosen to be who we are. We have chosen to be where we are at. We are the result of our choices. How we have chosen to respond. I, I, I think of the person in the concentration camp. He said, uh, you know, he was, was a survivor of the concentration camp. He said, I never would allow them to defeat me. No matter what they did or said, in my mind, I was still strong. <laughs> he couldn't control his surroundings. He couldn't control what his surroundings were doing, but he could control how he responded. And he said that if he, if he felt that he, if he lost that control, he would lose his life. And he survived. And he wasn't taken to the chambers and killed so you see, we are the result, you know, some of the choices and things that come our way are like the, the people in the concentration camp. We have no choice. But some of our choices, some of our daily lives are the exact result of our choices. And making right choices doesn't mean everything is going to go right. Jesus made right choices and they crucified him. So making right choices gives us the strength to live through the difficulties that come our life, knowing that the Holy Spirit is there to give us the strength. He, the person of the Holy Spirit, is there to give us joy, peace, patience, gentleness, to give us the strength of his word that we can apply to our minds and hearts, girding up our minds and our hearts with, with the word of God so that we are strong in our belief and strong in how we see things and know that God is in charge and God will help us make the right choices. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'll sing the hallelujah chorus, right? Ready? No. All right. <laughs> Father, we thank you. 
We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for your word that is a light to our path. We thank you, O oh God, for the strength of your Holy Spirit and the grace and mercy that is given to each of us. We pray for your word to help us in our choices and our decisions and that we do not live trying to relive our failures. Lord, we live living out our promise that comes from you. So we are grateful for the promise. We're grateful for this day. We're grateful for the choices and the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide us into our tomorrow.